Hello and welcome to another insightful edition of Investment Acorns. This is our exclusive series featuring thought leadership from fund managers at White Oak Capital Asset Management Limited. Joining me today is Manoj Jain. He's co-head product and strategies at White Oak Capital AMC. Welcome, Manoj. Thank you so much. Manoj has authored two very interesting uh, columns in September issues of both Wealth Insight and Mutual Fund Insight, and we'll delve deeper into them with him today. Now, let's begin with your column, uh, Chemistry of Investing in Mutual Fund Insight. You've drawn an intriguing comparison between chemistry and investing, particularly in how different asset classes, they combine like elements in a chemical reaction. So could you start by explaining how this analogy can help investors gauge or better grasp multi-asset allocation, uh, the concept of multi-asset allocation? In that article, basically, we tried to explain uh, with a simple analogy, we all know that uh, we have read in school also that when you combine two element or two atom of hydrogen with one atom of oxygen, we uh, come to a chemical uh, formula of H2O, which is nothing but water. But if you add one more element of oxygen, it becomes H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide, which is basically antiseptic. Right. So water, if you don't drink water, you will die. And Antiseptic, you drink antiseptic, you will die. So by changing only small proportion of same element, adding slightly more percentage of that element, change the entire composition. The same is true for many asset classes. All these asset classes have various degree of correlation with each other. Uh, we can use this correlation to achieve an optimal outcome. The optimal out outcome can be you want to achieve certain level of risk, which is measured as volatility mm -hmm. and certain level of reasonable return. So by using this correlation, we can achieve a right mix of various asset classes, which can help us achieve our desired level of return for desired level of volatility. So that is the whole idea behind that column. Okay. Now, in your column, you also mentioned that adding a bit of equity to a debt bond portfolio, that can uh, help achieve better risk adjusted returns. Can you elaborate more on this? You, you see, when we talk to many investors, uh, generally, it is believed that equity is volatile, which is true, by the way. Mm. Equity as compared to any bond portfolio is highly volatile. Obviously, over the long period of time, equity has the capability of generating very reasonable return as compared to debt. So debt is very stable, uh, but returns are very moderate. Equity can deliver very good return, but it is very volatile in the short term. So it is believed that if you are allocating some part of your wealth in equity, you are adding a volatility. Okay, yeah. but that may not be true always. So in that article itself, we have mentioned that when you add small amount of equity, let's say, instead of putting 100% of your assets in bond portfolio, if you make a combination of 90% bond and 10% equity, by adding 10% equity, actually, the annual volatility goes down. And that is because the correlation between these two asset classes, uh, these two asset classes are not perfectly correlated. Similarly, you can achieve similar level of volatility, which a 100% bond portfolio will otherwise deliver by adding, let's say, 20-25% equity. Mm -hmm. So by adding about 20-25% equity in your existing bond portfolio, you can achieve almost similar level of annual volatility, which a bond portfolio will deliver, but your return goes up by almost 3-4% to annually on an average, on a long period average. So again, you are using the chemistry of these asset classes that how they react with each other. And here the objective, let's say in this example, is that you want to achieve almost similar level of volatility on an annual basis. Hmm. Uh, you don't want to compromise on volatility part, but you want to enhance your return. So by adding 25% equity, you are enhancing return without compromising on the volatility part. Coming to another asset class, gold often plays a unique role in you know uh, multi-asset portfolios due to its negative correlation with other asset classes. So in today's economic conditions, with such uncertainties, how should be uh, how should investors be viewing gold as a part of their multi-asset portfolio? So you rightly said that gold has a negative correlation with most of the asset classes. We also know gold is a good hedge against inflation over the long period of time. It has the capability of beating inflation over the time. But what makes gold very interesting uh, from the perspective of multi-asset allocation portfolio is that it has negative correlation with most of the asset classes, for example, equity. Mm -hmm. And in times when there is too much uncertainty, uh, usually equity market doesn't do well 
but gold do very well because again it is regarded as a safe haven mm -hmm. so if you add let's say we had we were discussing about this portfolio instead of keeping 100 percent in bond if you keep let's say 75 percent in bond 25 percent equity you can achieve similar level of volatility uh, but your return goes up by a few percentage point on an average mm -hmm. now if you add gold in this portfolio let's add another third asset class and let's make a combination of 55 percent bond now 25 percent equity and another 20 percent gold okay if this is the combination again if you do an analysis of last 24 years data with this portfolio you can achieve almost similar level of volatility which 100 percent bond portfolio will otherwise deliver on an annual basis but your return goes by goes up by another couple of percentage gold is a very unique asset class when you look this asset class in isolation so you may feel disappointed that this asset class is generating okay slightly better return than uh, inflation uh, equity is a better asset class but if you use this correlation matrix uh, given the fact it is negative correlated with most of the asset classes you can use this asset class to reduce volatility or you can use this asset class to keep volatility intact and help increasing return for the overall portfolio all right. Now, you also pointed out that tax optimization can sometimes lead to uh, suboptimal asset allocation. So, what would you say to investors who tend to prioritize tax efficiency over more diversified uh, portfolios? So, definitely. First of all, I have a strong view that you should make all the efforts to minimize your tax liability in a legal way. Right. Earlier, what used to happen that, as you are aware, a few years back, equity used to be tax free. Okay, a few years back now, long term capital gain has been introduced. So now, both whether you are entering in a multi asset allocation fund, let's say, which has an equity taxation, or you are entering in a multi asset allocation fund, which typically keep, let's say, 35% plus in equity in equity related instrument. So both these structures are, no, are now tax efficient. In equity, after one year, gains are categorized as long term capital gain tax mm. and you have to pay let's say 12.5 percent plus surcharge and says whereas in second structure whereby you only buying let's say more than 35 percent in equity again after two years you have to pay 12.5 percent okay tax so first of all tax considering you are investing for more than two years is same almost same now earlier because people have this habit that i want to give equity taxation so if this is the criteria that I will invest minimum 65% in equity at all point of time, mm -hmm. which means you will allocate, let's say anything between 65 to 70% so that you ensure that at all point of time, the equity is minimum 65%. Now in multi-asset allocation category, uh, what the regulation says is that you have to invest minimum 10% in at least three asset classes. Let's say these three asset classes are bond, equity and gold. So if you have already invested 70% and that is your minimum threshold, now you have to add another 10-12% debt and another 10% gold. So you are left with only 7-8% of your asset to take benefit of this correlation or at some point of time if there is too much uncertainty. So let's take an example, you have 70% equity in your portfolio, 20% debt and 10% gold and there is too much uncertainty like, like take example of COVID. During 2020, let's say at the end of financial year 2020, uh, equity market was down by almost 30% in last one year. Gold was up by 25-30% in that financial year. But most of the multi-asset allocation fund were also down meaningfully. Because if you have 70% equity and only 10% gold, 10% gold cannot provide you the stability you are looking for. Right. But on the contrary, let's say you have a portfolio which has let's say 30-35% equity and another 20% gold. Equity is down by let's say 25%, gold is up by 20%, 25%. And you have another 50% parked in debt, which is earning let's say anything for the ease of understanding 7% return. So now this portfolio will react very differently in this scenario because gold will be able to protect a lot of downside from the equity market. So what I'm trying to say is that when you work with this precondition that minimum 70%, 65 to 70% has to be in equity, you cannot take benefit of this chemistry. For this chemistry to work, and like, like you rightly said, that market around the world are very dynamic. So to take advantage of developing situation and scenarios, you need to have flexibility. 
you need to have focus first on the right mix of asset allocation and then within those parameters you definitely should try to optimize for tax also so now there are two kind of structures available in the industry one those who are first focusing on equity taxation and then seeing what can be done to reduce volatility second structure which we believe is more optimal way to look at multi asset allocation strategy is that you first look at the right combination of these asset classes to achieve the desired outcome the desired outcome is to achieve certain level of volatility and then enhance reasonable return this can also be achieved and this can also be achieved in a very tax efficient manner in the current context okay but you know with so many different approaches available to fund managers to manage these funds differently what key factors should investors keep in mind when choosing the right fund for their portfolio i think there are many things which needs to be uh, aware of and need to consider while selecting one of the strategies that first of all you need to understand what is your end goal if your goal is to make the highest possible return and you are okay with whatever volatility is there i think any fund forget about multi asset allocation fund any fund which is equity heavy uh, should over the long term should deliver better return than as compared to any asset allocation strategy uh, with lot of volatility but if you are somebody uh, who is okay with reasonable moderate return but at the same time don't want to see minus 20% in your portfolio on an annual basis i think then you have to follow uh, then you have to consider those uh, products and schemes which are using the asset allocation uh, to reduce volatility and in that concern, uh, in in that context you have to first look at the underlying structure a particular fund house amc is following in managing multi asset allocation fund and if that structure is marrying with your investment objective or not so in short you have to first define what is your investment objective and for how much years you are investing what is your tolerance level with in terms of any movement and then obviously it is a good thing that many structures are available for investor to pick and choose that this structure so no structure is bad in my opinion now it is for investor to decide that which structure is matching their investment objective okay and to to understand that one should first gauge their risk appetite you say 100% all right now moving on to your other column which was in wealth insight winners rotate so let's begin with why you think it's risky for investors to stick with just one strategy or one style even if it's performing well currently so this is another interesting topic and uh, we try to explain this concept with the help of some data also let's take an example of a index which represents broader market bsc 500 mm. okay now bsc 500 covers almost 90% or more the entire stock market of india in terms of market capitalization so if we divide bsc 500 in various factors so one factor can be growth style versus value style so there are few stocks you can categorize them value stock there are few stocks you can categorize them growth stock because they are growing at a much faster pace mm-hmm. so in bsc 500 the weightages of these two style is almost 50 50% 49% value 51% growth more broadly 50 50% likewise another factor can be psu company or non psu company so right now almost 13% of the bsc 500 index has psu weightage another factor can be large cap versus small and mid cap put together so about 73% is large cap at this point of time about 27% is small and mid cap there can be another factors as export oriented businesses domestic oriented businesses or uh, risk sensitive businesses and non risk sensitive businesses so these are all factors now if you bet on one particular factor now how you can bet on one particular factor let's say you are a fund manager and your mandate is to create a flexi cap portfolio diversified across sectors mm-hmm. but you have a natural tilt that i am a value investor and uh, i will invest more of my money in value oriented stocks mm-hmm. so let's say index has only 50% stocks categorized as value but you invest 90% of your assets in value stocks so what will happen there will be years which is very uh, favorable for value stocks and there will be years where which are you know against not so no not so favorable so like 2018 19 20 mm-hmm. if you look at these three years these three years were very unfavorable for value investing uh if you draw a chart of annual return of various styles value was at the bottom 2018 19 20 for three consecutive years 
But if you look at last three years, like 2021, 2023, or uh, 2023, in fact, partly 2024 also, a calendar year till date, value is at the top. Likewise, PSU, for many years, PSU were underperforming, you know that. For many, many years, they were underperforming and everybody just gave up on them that uh, they, they are just doing uh, charity work and they will never make money. But for last three years, they are at the top. Mm. The same thing can be uh, seen from the context of large cap versus small and mid cap. During 2018 calendar year and 19 calendar year, small cap were at the bottom. Large caps were doing very well. But right now, for the last two, three years, small caps. Are. So if you bet on one particular factor, you will be either at the top or at the bottom. So your performance, now how you measure performance, let's say in the context of mutual fund, typically you compare with benchmark. So if we are talking about a flexi cap fund, the benchmark is BSC 500 TRI. So because your BSC 500 has a 50-50% weightage to, to these two factor value versus growth, but you have 80-90% allocation to value. In 2018-19-20, you will be at the bottom in terms of performance. Your underperformance as compared to benchmark will be very high. But in last three years, you will be at the top. So the volatility of alpha will be very significant. Uh, the performance uh, volatility in terms of whether you are in top one quartile or bottom quartile will be very high when you bet on one particular factor because these factors are influenced by macros. Mm -hmm. And macros are beyond us. We can at best try to figure it out what will be their impact, but there will be something happening somewhere in the world. Like recently it was geopolitical tension between Russia and Ukraine they have impacted differently uh, to different segment of the market. For defense, they were like very good. Uh, they, it was a very favorable outcome. But for many other businesses, it may not be. So to sum up uh, to, to your question that, yes, winners rotate because of some external uh, events which are beyond our control. Index, let's say we are talking about BSC 500, is an amalgamation of various factors. As a fund manager who is managing a flexi cap fund diversified across sectors, you can try to marry those factors in line with the index or you can divert uh, your portfolio in particular for, for, for particular factor that my style is that I will only invest in small and mid cap because I'm very good at it. My style is that I'm very good in picking value stock. My style is that I am very bullish on PSU. These extreme uh, can May, maybe over the long period of time, they can generate decent return, but intermittently, it can give a very volatile investing experience. Right. Now, you also touched upon the concepts of active share and active risk in your column. So, could you break these down? Explain how everyday investors can use these metrics to build more resilient portfolios. Sure. So, see, when people invest in, let's say, active mutual funds, let's say we are talking about flexi cap category. So, your expectation is that Okay, BSC 500 is delivering, let's say, X percentage return, let's say 10% return. So because I'm giving this money to some professional fund manager, they should generate, let's say, 1% or 2% higher return than the benchmark. Mm. Okay, so to beat the benchmark, first of all, you have to create a portfolio which is slightly different than the benchmark. If you buy all those 500 stock in same proportion, you cannot beat the benchmark. You will underperform the benchmark because there are charges and uh, transaction charges, etc. So you have to create a portfolio which is slightly different than the benchmark. So to what extent your portfolio is different from the benchmark is called active share. So active share is basically how much of your portfolio by weightages is different from the benchmark. So, so let's active say, management here, sir. Yeah, active management. So it is a measure active share percentage. Uh, it is a percentage number. Let's say it can be 60%. So if we say that this particular scheme or this particular mutual flexicap mutual fund scheme has a 60% active share, it means 60% of the portfolio composition is different from the uh, benchmark. Now, it is important because only then potentially you can generate alpha because you are buying a portion of the market which is not present in the benchmark, but you believe should do better than the benchmark or maybe you are ignoring, avoiding certain stocks which are part of the benchmark, but not part of your portfolio. Hopefully, with a belief that these stocks will be under the, these stocks will underperform the benchmark and hence they are not part of my portfolio so i will be able to outperform so first of all active share is very important without this you cannot even potentially generate alpha forget about generating alpha you cannot generate alpha without active share now second is that just to 
have active share you should not build active share just just to show that i my portfolio is different from the benchmark uh, there should be solid reasoning that these are the stocks i like and this is the fundamental reason and that's why i believe that these should, stocks should do well there are few stocks which are part of the benchmark which should be your portfolio as well because these are very good stocks and they should do well just because they are part of the benchmark i will not buy it that should not be the idea now if you build too much active share now this is important thing that active share can be built by two way first of all you bet on particular factor like we discussed that benchmark has 50 percent value stock i buy all those 50 uh, all those value stock but let's say i look at 100 percent of my portfolio in those uh, 50 stocks so again you will build up active share because your portfolio will look different than the benchmark mm -hmm. but now your portfolio is exposed to a factor risk the vector name is value so your portfolio is exposed to value factor risk mm -hmm. so in years when value will do well your portfolio will out outshine everybody else or vice versa mm -hmm. so this is one way of generating active share so you want to generate active share this is one way of second way of generating active share which we believe is an ideal way is that let's say benchmark has 50 percent value stock 50 percent growth stock. you also keep around 50 percent value 50 percent growth but within value stock which stock i want to buy mm -hmm. and within growth stock which stock we want to buy or avoid so this is called bottom-up stock picking mm -hmm. now the benefit of generating active share by this second approach is that you are neutralizing any factor risk which can impact your portfolio and within those factor itself you are buying stocks which you believe based on your research are fundamentally good company so by creating this portfolio which is factor diversify you can achieve active share but without increasing active risk so what is active risk so let me just explain this also so active risk is basically all this thing we are doing to generate alpha let's say potentially there is a two percent alpha but when you generate active share by betting on one particular factor your alpha volatility increases because there will be some years your alpha will be let's say 10 percent there will be few years there your alpha will be let's say minus eight percent on an average it will be two percent mm -hmm. so active risk measures the alpha volatility if the alpha volatility is too high so your active share will look very high whereas in second approach if you build active share by neutralizing to some extent diversifying across various sectors and only focusing on stock picking you can achieve active share by keeping active risk low which means your alpha volatility will be low so ideally an investor should try i mean this is more for the fund managers to manage it but fund managers the ideal situation is that if I can achieve a desired level of active share, let's say 60% active share without increasing active risk. This is the ideal situation that without increasing alpha volatility, I am potentially will be able to add alpha. Okay. Now, you mentioned factor diversified portfolios. You also mentioned this term factor diversified balanced portfolio, which might sound confusing to some investors. Can you explain what is it and how it helps investors to avoid dramatic ups and downs in their portfolio? So for example, let's take current situation. Today, there are too much uh, discussion about PSU doing well. They are doing really well, comment has increased cap, etc. But index has only 13% weightage in PSU. So right now, if you invest, let's say 30, 40, 50% of your portfolio in PSU, or let's say in direct lay of PSU, let's say today, defense is another segment which is uh, hot today. So you are diverting your portfolio as an investor at an at an investor level if most of your the funds you have picked in the mutual fund basket are psu oriented mm -hmm. value oriented okay or let's say particular theme oriented defense or manufacturing so you don't even know realize but you are tilting your portfolio towards one factor factor you are not balancing out because index is only 13 percent psu but you have let's say 30 40 50 percent psu depending on direct or indirect exposure so the way uh, we want to build a portfolio or we are we are suggesting investors to build their portfolio is that don't take too much uh, diversion in terms of betting on one particular factor if you do that your performance will be very volatile on a um, year by year basis and there can be prolonged period of underperformance for example i gave you this example of 18 19 20 for three years 
value philosophy underperformed. Prior to that, almost for six years, PSUs have underperformed before they come back in 21, 22, 23. So, will you be able, I mean, will you be comfortable that your portfolio is underperforming for six straight years? I don't think people will be comfortable. And in that situation, what happens? Because you have taken very skewed bet on one particular factor and that particular factor is underperforming for three, four, five years, you tend to give up on that factor. Mm. But winners rotate, that factor will work someday. Mm. But the three year, five year is a long period, gestation period for somebody to hold on that portfolio and they end up doing mistake. Most of us, including us, I mean, most of us, we all are human, we end up giving on that factor and we end up changing that factor at the very long time. Mm -hmm. So to sum up, what do we mean by balancing out these factors is that consciously investors should make an effort that they should either invest in a portfolio, flexi cap portfolio, which is diversified in all these factors, or if they are investing in various scheme, they pick and choose fund houses or fund managers with different, different style. They are fund managers who are very, uh, bullish or let's say they are very overweight on value factor, they are fund houses or fund manager, they are very overweight on growth factors. You can have small cap schemes in your portfolio, large cap schemes in your portfolio, export oriented funds in your portfolio, defense oriented. So there should be a combination of various factors so that no one factor will determine your performance in that particular calendar year. All right. Now, moving on, many investors, they tend to heavily uh, lean towards one style of investing, either value or growth. So what are some of the dangers of, you know, focusing too much on one style and how can that impact the overall portfolio? The biggest risk is that uh, that there can be prolonged cycles of underperformance in for very, any particular factor. Like you gave example of value versus growth. Uh, uh, they can be they, in histor historically also there, there was a period for three years when value has underperformed and now it is outperforming. There was a period when growth did very well, but now it is underperforming. So the biggest risk is that when a particular factor uh, uh, does very well for let's say two, three years, most of us start to believe that this is the only thing which will work over the time mm -hmm. and we tend to allocate more towards the, those strategy which can be detrimental because as I said winners rotate that is the <laughs> adding of a column also. Mm -hmm. So these things keep on rotating something which has worked well in the past may or may not most likely it may not work very well. So the biggest risk is that uh, the prolonged cycle of underperformance led to investor taking wrong decision at the very uh, wrong time because more often people tend to give up on one particular strategy at the bottom of the strategy which is the uh, worst Most thing to do. Right. So there will be years you will uh, see your strategy doing phenomenally well but there will be years you will see your neighbors getting rich but you are <laughs> at the uh, you know you at the margin of your strategy mm -hmm. you are not doing so well. So again that leads to revenge buying you tend to buy things which are which have done very well uh, believing that your strategy is poor and that is exactly you should not be doing it now for those who want to invest more strategically how can they strike a balance between different strategies or factors to achieve more consistent results i think for that you need to read more about a fund house strategy uh, their philosophy uh, and more specifically the fund manager with whom you are investing uh, various fund managers have their own style investing nothing bad about it but over the years they have developed a style of their own so if you're investing it with the investor uh, with a fund manager who is let's say very very value tilted i think it makes a lot of sense that you pick another good fund manager which is very very growth tilted or else you pick a fund manager or fund house where they have openly communicated that our strategy or our philosophy is that we don't bet on one particular factor and we try to make a factor diversified portfolio so, so that you don't have to worry about that uh, this is a growth uh, style of fund manager and this is a value style of fund manager. You give that money to, let's say, we try to uh, communicate to our investor that we try to create a very factor diversified portfolio and within those factors, we only focus on bottom up stock picking for potentially generating alpha. Mm -hmm. So these are the two ways. Either you pick a fund house which is factor diversified in their philosophy or you pick two or three fund house with different, different style of management. Hopefully all these three are good. So you will be able to create a factor diversified portfolio. All right. With that, we've reached the end of this conversation. Thank you, Manoj, for taking the time for this conversation. It was great having you. Thank you so much, Alchila. Thanks.